Terry, good to see you. Likewise, Mike. My broadcast today is uh, is about is with a very famous son of a very famous father, and um, we are going to talk. Uh, when I've introduced him to you, we're going to talk about his reminiscences of his dad. But um, I, need, I need to start with to talk a little bit about his career, which has been amazing. And, and no doubt at some point in the future will be the subject of another full broadcast. But uh, Kerry, Kerry Levy, how, how would you define um, who you are and what you do? <laughs> Um, yeah, probably a charlatan. I, I don't know. I, I, I try so many things, you know, I mean, I've, I guess I'd say really, I'm a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker and writer. That That's where it starts. But then there's all sorts of offshoots that interest me. You constantly seem to have been able to reinvent yourself, which I find quite amazing. Just tell us a little bit about that, uh, the, the documentary filmmaking, because that's been also involved a major film with music, musicians, hasn't it? Tell yeah. A bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it started about 30 years ago. Um, God, I make myself sound old. Um, I remember when it only used to be like a few years ago. Now you go, there are people who've been born and been everywhere around the world in that amount of time and, and lived full lives. But uh, yeah, I, I got involved... I tried for years to be a musician uh, and a successful one and only got so far and gave up music and decided that I wanted to do something sensible with my life. I, I didn't know that. What did you play? Guitar. Did you? Yeah. And that, that's what I used to play. So I used to play in bands and um, I, I set out to, to become a rock and roll star discovered the lifestyle, forgot the music. Um, kind of wrong way to do it. So uh, gave it up and decided I'd do something sensible to work out what to do with my life. So I went and worked in, in a bookshop for two years. And um, that gave me time to think, time to read. And then I found myself being gravitating towards more visual arts. And a friend of mine invited me along to a film shoot that he was uh, doing for a band and shooting a promo. And I'll never forget, um, I was just standing on the side, it was a nighttime shoot, and somebody just shouted, well, someone, someone went and hosed the set down. And I looked and nobody moved. And I looked to my left and I saw a hose, and then somebody said, will somebody hose the set down? And I looked and I waited and I was sort of, mm, what's this all about? And then somebody went, will someone effing well hose the set down? And I thought, well, I better do this. And I picked up this hose, turned it on, and just sprayed everything with this hose. This guy comes running over and said, I don't know you. Did you just do that? Did you just do what I thought you did? And I went, yeah, I did. He said, great. Would you like a, a job for the next two days? You can come and help me in the art department. And that was it. I, I got hooked. And my friend suddenly saw me. He'd invite me along to watch. And he just said, that's typical you. You have no idea what you're doing, but somehow you find yourself in, right in the middle of it all. And that, that was it. From then on, we became partners. We went on and made uh, promos for bands. Probably our big break was working with a band called Blur. And we made um, a film which was very much covered the period of uh, the early Britpop years. And it's become you know, a very popular film with people. And from then on, we did a lot of promos for all those sort of bands. And then I started making um, more films with uh, Gorillaz, which was Damon Albarn's offshoot from Blur, one of his sideline projects. And that we thought would just be a bit of a laugh because it was an animated cartoon band. Little did we know how successful it would become. I documented the whole uh, project from the very start for the first seven and a half years. And we traveled the world, God knows how many times, recorded it all, and it came out as a documentary film called Bananas. And that was kind of, you know, what took up a lot of my time for a long time. 
So yes, uh, music's an important part of my life. And I got back into music by coming through a different door. I met you originally um, in your role as an art dealer. Yes. Um, and how, how long has that been going on? Well, I think my dad, who we'll get to talk about, he, it, it was, it's a genetic thing, um, as you found in your family. Um, my dad, I was always surrounded by art and artists from an early age, but I'll never forget my dad uh, sent me in with a picture to the Fine Art Society uh, at the age of seven um, to, to complete the deal. I think it was all a setup. I think maybe everyone knew, but for me at that age, I really felt I'd sold a picture to them. He let me take it in and I saw them there and they handed me the check. And from that moment, I felt like I was an art dealer. So, so, were, so were you doing the art when you, at the same time as you were doing the music? Did that run uh, on current? No, that sort of really kicked in afterwards. I, yeah. I sort of, when I gave up, I, I got into, actually the, the uh, friend of mine who, Matthew Longfellow, the, the guy I worked with making all the films, um, he was quite a successful editor at the time working for a company and he was editing for, for people like Ridley Scott and Tony Kay and all the big directors. And um, we always talked about getting a business together and I, I, I was playing a lot of sport at the time. And I remember I broke my wrist playing hockey because I used to play in goal. And I was really miserable. And um, I said to him, oh, I'd really like to go somewhere I love, somewhere like Cornwall or something. He said, well, what the hell, let's just go. And we jumped in his car and we drove down there. And we got to a, a, a shop and there was a, an arts and crafts table, which I remember because during my teenage years, I'd help my dad buy and sell uh, Liberty Furniture and things, because he also wrote a book about Liberty called Liberty Style and the whole Art Nouveau period. Um, and I saw this brilliant Liberty table for like 32 quid. And um, so we picked it up, put it in the boot, got back to London. I think we sold it for 180 or something. And he said, well, why don't we set up a business? And I said, OK. So we went and got a, a shop in or a stall in antiquarius in chelsea on the king's road and that was it for the next however many years before i became a filmmaker um i was an antique dealer right so yeah Extra extraordinary but just before we move on to talking about your reminiscences of your of your dad um you, you you've also done other things you write you have partnered uh, an amazingly successful partnership with um, so, some caricaturist, just trying desperately to remember his name. Was it Gerald Scar? Uh, oh, no! no. <laughs> <laughs> That's you've a joke been, never to make. You've, um, been, you've been working with Ralph Steadman for quite a number of years now, and you're the other half, really, aren't you? Yeah, I, I, I suppose I've been very lucky in, in a way that I've... I suppose a lot of my, my work has involved going into partnership with people. I like collaborating. Collaborating is a fantastic thing to do. It's, some, it's a way of feeding off the energies of each other and, and not getting too bogged down in just your own thinking, because that, that can happen. So yeah, Ralph and I have worked together now for, I think it's nine years, and we've done three books together, all about uh, well extinct, endangered, and critically endangered birds and animals. And we've been pointing out the problems that are faced by many of the world's creatures today. But yeah, Ralph is, I, I've never worked with anybody like Ralph. He, he's one of the greatest people I've ever met. And he is so wonderful to work with, you know, and every day feels a little empty if I haven't spoken to him, because I usually speak to him most days. And you've also, just, just to show this your extraordinary career, suddenly found yourself on the on the tennis circuit <laughs> yes how on earth did that happen well um sports always been a major part of my life i used to play it and then um i became quite ill and wasn't able to play sport anymore but um it's one of those things that's always been part of my life and i, I do a podcast about football 
um, anyway, well, about my football team, Chelsea. Um, and one of the people that we used to get on that um, is a journalist. And he was working for the LTA, the Lawn Tennis Association, and he was editing their magazine called Ace Magazine. Um, and he said to me, he said, you know, I'd really like to get you involved writing for me um, because I think you'd have a different take on tennis. And so I said, yeah, what the hell? And the first gig he gave me was going to the Monte Carlo Masters. Um, and he arranged it with, with all the authorities. And I got picked up by helicopter from Nice Airport and flew in with a couple of uh, the players and, and their relatives. Okay. Yeah, this is all right. Um, I can handle this. I actually didn't like Monaco very much. That's another story. And I started writing about tennis. And then we decided to expand that and create our own podcast series. So I've spent the last year on and off going around talking to all the tennis players, not about the match they play, but about the psychology of playing, the, the mentality that you need to be successful at a high level level of any sport so um yeah I found, I found it interesting I think some of the players were confused by me because I didn't ask them but I very rarely ever said oh well played today that was a pretty good game I'd be going you know so how on earth do you deal with this or that and just trying to understand what makes a sports man or woman tick and, and tennis at what level the at the highest level you're working with at the highest level yeah I mean I've talk to all sorts of people from Novak Djokovic through to, you know, um, Joe Conta through to Federer. I mean, you name it. I actually found that I really loved the women's game even more than the men's game. And the women are far more interesting to talk to as well. Um, well yeah, absolutely. People like Naomi Osaka, Simona Hallett, um, you know, Katrina Pliskova, um, all of these people were really interesting to chat to and had an interesting slant on things and were really very open. I mean, a lot of the men were as well. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I've had a, a really fascinating time talking to tennis players. We, we're going to do a, another broadcast, you and I, at some point where we'll pick one of these things which you've done and look at that in detail. But... What I really wanted to do today, your dad was mega famous, Mervyn Levy, writer, artist, raconteur, teacher, and met some, lived a, a, an amazing time and obviously had great eyes for the people that he worked with. Um, and I know that as a little boy, you were quite a part of that because you already said you were taken around at the age of seven, you did your first deal. And I would love you to recount some of the stories uh, about your dad. Where, yeah. where, should we, where should we start? Who should we start with? Ooh, you, you can, well, funny enough, I was just talking, you've got an Augustus John um, um, you've you've got a lot of Augustus John prints, haven't you? And we have an Augustus John. Thank you for the plug. We we <laughs> we have a um, Francis, <coughs> Francis Spalding, who I did a chat with. Um, I think it was last week. Has just written a piece for us on Augustus John because we have something like two thirds of all the etchings that he ever made, and there's not been an Augustus John etching exhibition in this country for about 50 years but we will have one of those shortly well it, yes we have got some augustus john okay why I was, I was going to refer to that is because um my dad i'll put it into context my, my dad was born in swansea um and he grew up with dylan thomas um and they were with each other an awful lot of the time. Funny enough, I did a festival a couple of years ago in Swansea and I got invited to speak in Dylan's old family home. And, you know, it's nothing particularly special, you know, it's two up, two down kind of place, um, little, um, little house. Um, but it's really weird because they've decked it out as how they thought it was at the time when Dylan was there. Um, and it was really strange. I got a very eerie, but fabulously eerie feeling when I was sitting in the kitchen 
realizing that my dad and Dylan would have burst through the door at some point after school or whatever um, and would be in the same room. Uh, and I, I found a real connection there that, um, that was quite indescribable really because they were close. Um, naturally Dylan's fame meant that everyone never got the same sort of closeness as his life um, evolved into what it finally became. Um, but there was uh, a real feeling of belonging, I guess. And, and then walking up the stairs, there was a picture of my dad up there as well. So it, that, was, that was kind of odd. And I went to see the old family home and it was now a, a lawyer's or something. And um, yeah, it was just strange. I walked from where my dad had described about, um, about uh, going up to Dylan's every day uh, and what have you. And um, yeah, I, I, I found it fascinating. But so they grew up together and they moved to London together during the thirties. And they shared a, a, a house. I've got, I've got a little bit of dad's writing somewhere, which I might try and uh, dig out and read a little piece for you. But, um, you know, this, this is uh, one of those strange quirks that I've, I've, when I moved up to Rutland, uh, I brought all my dad's old boxes and family boxes, which I've never really opened. And I started opening boxes and start re finding all sorts of things like this, which is called Breakfast with Dylan by Mervyn Levy. <laughs> and, it, and the instruction is read very slowly, <laughs> um, which I think is fantastic. Um, I would probably need to get my glasses on to read uh, something about that. But, um, you know, it's there are there's so much in there that, you know, maybe I'll, I'll read some of that in a bit. But the point was about Augustus, bringing it back to Augustus John, is that in their early days in Chelsea, they drink on the King's Road with Augustus John and Augustus John, by all accounts, would get very, very drunk. Uh, by very, very early in the evening. Um, and so Dad and, and Dylan would help him back to his, uh, his, his place. And he used to sleep in the top of the, the garret, as it were. And they'd help him up and he'd be trying to find everything. And he'd be sort of pulling out his pocket and dropping all this money behind him. And so one of them would be helping Augustus up to bed while the other one was picking up all the coins. And once they got into bed and had fleeced poor Augustus, they'd go out drinking for the rest of the night. So, so, so yes, that was the, the kind of shenanigans they, they used to get up to. So, you know, there, there was this magic about, about them that, that they were, you know, nicely but badly behaved, I, I guess is the, the best way of describing it. Um, they, they, yeah, really got up to all sorts of stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I, it's like I read this first few lines on this. Um, on those rare occasions, and this is um, when they were living in Chelsea, on those rare occasions when Dylan was home for breakfast, he liked nothing better than beer, cake, and perhaps an apple. To my knowledge in those days, he never varied these basic breakfast components, except sometimes to omit either the cake or the apple or both, but never the beer. <laughs> anyway, we didn't always have cake and apples, but we were never without beer when Dylan was in residence, simply because he was prudent enough to bring home a flagon or two of ale at night, thoughtfully sparing a half bottle or so for breakfast the following morning. The home I'm talking about was a large old house in Chelsea, 21 Colhern Road to be exact, where over a period of some two years, from early in 1934 to late in 1935, I lived with Dylan and the painters Fred James and William Scott. So uh, that's, that's quite a, a household straight away. So uh, yeah, I, it goes on and it, it, it explores more of the relationship and the things they get up to and, and how they, they get pretty drunk and try and work out how many mice it would take to pull a train from Swansea to London and, <laughs> and how you how you would do that so quite sensible stuff really <laughs> but but their friendship was was something that 
dad never really wrote enough about it or or talked about it overly um and it, and it's a real shame because he he really you know was very close to dylan and, and i'm sure there's great things that have not been archived and it's one thing as a documentary maker i really regret is i'm so keen on documenting 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 and maybe that's born out of the fact that i never sat my dad down and got all the stories from him because everybody he met there, there's so many great stories and you your know dad did, your dad did some drawings of dylan didn't he yeah i've got, I've got one here um this is Oh, we'll try and get it away from me. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, he's a, Dad was also a very, very good draftsman. <clears throat> you know, he went he went to the Royal College. Um, he ended up actually in, uh, in later years teaching at the Royal College. Um, but he, he was a very, very good artist in his own right. And really could have quite happily been an artist, but he preferred to write. So that was quite intriguing. Um, but yeah, he, he and Dylan, the, there's many, many tales that uh, that sadly we'll never get, but um, I wish I'd have recorded them all. Um, Wasn't there a, a, was there a production of Under Milk Wood once that you... Tell yeah. Us, tell us about that. That was when they were trying to get to pay for the plaque in Westminster Abbey in Poets Corner. Right. You have to raise the money. So... Um, we were very close friends with, with Dylan's daughter, Ironwi, um, and her husband, Trevor, and, um, we used to see them. So sorry, when, when would that have been? Roughly? This has been in the eighties, early eighties. Right. And you um, were, were you a teenager? 82, 82. I know that because I've got a little, um, copy of a, a, a drawing, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, yeah, I would have been... Uh, 20 right so um so yeah we we all went along i run we and um all of dylan's closest friends which were people like sir hugh weldon and emlyn williams i think it was um organized this um gala performance of under milk wood and uh one of the, the the main sort of there was going to be an auction a charity auction as well which was one of dad's portraits of dylan and um the, the buzz was there that it looked as though we might be able to get Richard Burton to be the narrator. Um, and we knew it was true, but the, it was actually all over the press that, you know, Burton, the Hollywood star, was coming back to London and was going to perform. And there were also rumours that he was having a, a bit of a thing, possibly again with Elizabeth Taylor. So um, no one knew if that was true or not um, up until the actual day. But uh, it turns out that somebody, part of the team, um, ended up going for a, a quiet drink with Burton the night before, which basically turned into an all-nighter with Burton and Taylor um, and going back to Burton's room and everybody getting really rather drunk. So. Burton turned up for a little bit of a rehearsal the next day, very weary and very bleary eyed. And no one knew what was going to happen that evening. But sure enough, uh, come showtime, Burton speaking and, and then suddenly there's this voice from behind him and it's Elizabeth Taylor who appears and the whole place goes into raptures because, I mean, she really was the epitome of, Hollywood A-list then. I mean, Burton was to an extent, but Taylor was somewhere different. And that was it. And they start kissing and it's all magnificent. And um, funnily enough, they, they hold the charity auction um, for, for the picture and Burton buys it um, and gives it as a gift to Elizabeth Taylor, which uh, was, was quite uh, a thing, really. And afterwards, we all end up going to the Garrick uh, Club for, for dinner and we sat at the main table with Ironwi and her husband, Sir Hugh Weldon. Um, there was also uh, my mum, my dad, a girl I'd taken to try and impress. I think she was overly impressed. Um, and um, 
also Burton and Taylor on our on our table, and uh, that was that was quite amazing. And I remember Dad was wearing an old Victorian waistcoat, and uh, Burton at one point after everyone was getting in their cups, and um, Burton at one point says, "I think you should give me that waistcoat." And my father says, "No, well, why should I? Because I'm Richard Burton." And, and he said, well, I don't give a damn who you are. It's my waistcoat. And they start squaring up to each other. And it, it's kind of playing. What, and, uh, you know, they're saying, well, everyone's calm down. And I remember getting up and telling them both to calm down and put my hand on their shoulders. And they were. And it, a lot of Welsh bluster. It was, it was magnificent. And, um, but it all ended up amicably. And Dad did a drawing of um, Burton. Uh, at 3 a.m. the 1st of March 1982. Wow. This is just a photocopy of it. Um, it's now in the National Museum of Wales, I believe. So, um, yeah, that was an extraordinary night with, with those two. And then naturally uh, we went along when Dylan became part of uh, Poets' Corner, rightly so. How it could have been possibly any other way as a proud Welshman. I have no idea. Who, who was the first artist that your dad started to write about? Um, probably, well, actually, it's probably Godier Brzezka. Right. Um, I think that was the first. I know what you thought I was going to say, but <laughs> we'll, we'll get on to, on to that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, um, Godier was, was um, one of those people that dad was totally enamoured with. He did a, the first book on any of his drawings. Um, you know, it, it took a while for people to really take Godier seriously because he had such a short life that there wasn't that much readily available for people to see. But uh, uh, interestingly, you, you know, um, through Godier and all the associations with, um, he, he also became very good friends with Horace Brodsky, right. who was actually uh, a very good friend of, um, of uh, Godier's and somewhere. Um, here, I've got a portrait of me by Horace Brodsky. Wow. But, uh, again, sorry about the glare, but yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, so well, um, yeah, all those sort of things. I, I, I guess here we go, piles of pictures falling down. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you were going to say Scotty Wilson or I, well, I, I, more I, Lowry. I, I was. I, I wanted to ask about Lowry. Okay, but um, well, Lowry. I mean, I guess Dad's probably writing-wise is best known for his uh, books on Lowry, and uh, Dad was one of the very first people to get into Lowry, and um, they became very good friends. Um, and they were friends actually. I think since I think he went and wrote. Uh, for the studio magazine, which he became the editor of during the 60s. Um, and studio, the studio magazine is such an important publication, especially during, I think, that real change of voice during the 50s to 70s that we had. The 60s was such a heyday for the studio magazine. And, and Dad was at the forefront of that, and he was picking out people to, to talk to. I mean, you look at the old magazines, I mean, I've got a, uh, one here, which I'll show you in a bit, but um, yeah, Lowry was, was incredible. I, um, I don't have the actual photos to hand, but there's some lovely photos of Dad drawing Lowry as well. Um, and again, you know, Dad, whenever possible, would like to do portraits of people. And uh, he did a fantastic portrait of, of, of Lowry. Um, but yeah, that, he was quite something else, Lowry, because there was a there was a, a, a time when actually Lowry would come any time he'd come to London, he would come and see us. And um, I got to know him quite a bit as a kid. Um, interestingly, um, I found this bit of writing from my mum. Actually, this is another new bit of writing. Um, it's basically about Colin Wilson, you know, who wrote The Outsider. And he he was a very good friend of dad's. And um, my mum writes, uh, my first meeting with Colin Wilson was at a party Mervyn and I gave at our flat in East Sheen, which is uh, just near Richmond, uh, Greater London, to celebrate the publishing of Mervyn's books, 
the moons of paradise. Um, this was really about uh, the breast in art. Um, it was quite a, a, a radical book to write at the time, I guess. Uh, we invited William Scott, the painter, and his wife, Mary, Bob Rake, critic of the Tatler, and his wife, Barbara, uh, Ellis Lowry, the Northern artist, and a few others. Lowry had arrived with Mervyn after recording a talk um, called Speaking Personally, which due to Lowry's reticence and inherent modesty had to be edited thoroughly and revised for a smaller morning talk. And um, Lowry was rather red faced and harassed. And we discussed the recording and go, was I all right? Will it do? Did I give the right answers? I didn't like some of the questions Mervyn asked, you know, especially when you asked me why I hadn't married. I don't think that is for the public to know, you know, that is my private life. Um, and, and then the doorbell rings and Mervyn ushered in Colin Wilson, a tall, loose limbed boyish creature with a lock of light brown hair falling softly over his forehead. And uh, it, yeah, it just goes on and on about the, the whole evening. Um, there is one brilliantly shocking bit um, where Colin easily moved amongst the guests, obviously the master of himself and others. His introductory remarks were nearly all said to shock. Tell me, how often do you masturbate? Or how many times a week do you have sex? And to me, Marie, I must talk to you about sex sometime. He moved over to Ellis Lowry and myself, who were discussing the moons of paradise. Oh yes, he said, as his quick ears found the subject, Mervyn's first dirty book, isn't it? Lowry looked rather aghast and reddened. Is it? Is it really a dirty book then? He asked anxiously. No, of course not, I assured him. It mentions sex a lot, but covers all aspects of sex related to art through the ages. Oh, then I must get a copy tomorrow. Yes, I'll get a copy tomorrow. So Lowry, obviously close to being out of his depth with these avant-garde, you know, beatniks as it, they probably, Colin would have been termed as then, but he was a, he was a charming man. He was lovely. And, um, uh, you know, I actually got some drawings from him when I was younger, because whenever I'd see him, dad would always say, take your autograph book. I said, but he doesn't sign autographs. Exactly. You'll probably get a little drawing instead. So, um, and it's true. Uh, sadly, I don't have them anymore. They are actually in the book, the drawings of Ellis Lowry. Um, when I was older, at about 13 or 14, I sold them to buy my first electric guitar. Did you? Yes. Interesting, because so. when you were talking about um, Colin Wilson's book, The Outsider, I already had that um, that word outsider in my mind, thinking about the the people that your dad was drawn to, because although you wouldn't now describe them as outsider arts, wasn't that? But Godier was outside the norm, and Lowry was, and then of course Scotty Wilson was. Your dad yeah. obviously had a real feeling for these these men who were. Great, um, great artists, but not in the normal pattern of things. No, I think uh, instinctive artists, they're, yeah. they're drawing on some strange internal well. I mean, I know all artists do, but there's a great difference between, say, somebody like Sutherland or Piper compared to someone like Wilson uh, and Lowry. You know, this is... There, there is a yeah. There, there, there's a, a difference. There's they're not mainstream one way or another, but actually end up creating their own mainstream. Um, so yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think I think he always found it more intriguing the the artist who perhaps in some ways either has to a struggle a bit or b not give a damn at all. Uh, and somebody like Scotty, well. You know, I, every Sunday we used to go to Kilburn to, to see Scotty because we'd take him out for, for tea. We'd go to the Lion's Tea House every Sunday with him. And I was only, what, three, four, up until I, when did he die in the 70s? I think I was about 13 or so when he died. But I love Scotty. He was so blooming miserable. But he'd be winding my dad up and going, hey, you really should give me a bit more money for that, you know. You're a bloody thief as always, bloody thief, I tell you. 
me. And then he'd look at me and he'd just wink at me. And, you know, it was all a game. It was, it was, it was fantastic. And, you know, he died with a lot more money than people thought, uh, I think. He used to shove it in, in, you know, crates and, and, and what have you. And, you know, he'd have money all over the place, hidden away. But hey, he was, he was, I loved him and he could never say my name right. He'd never call me Kerry. He, all my life, he called me Telly. And uh, don't ask me why, but I, I, I ate Telly. Uh, and, you know, yeah, mum and dad just gave up trying to correct him. But um, it was fine. But, yeah, I, I, lo I loved, I loved um, uh, going to see him. He, there was something about him. He had a mischievous energy. In fact, oddly enough, um, you mentioned that. There's a, a little bit in here where, yeah, that I found in this bit of writing mum did about Colin Wilson when they went down to go and stay with him in, in Cornwall, where he's living with one of his mistresses. Um, he seemed to spend the time traveling between different people, did Colin. Um, and uh, there we go. Yep, yeah, we went down for his birthday and it, it said, um, we're given Colin one of our prized possessions for his birthday a hand-painted plate by a dear friend of ours, Scotty Wilson. We were somewhat dismayed when Colin calmly accepted it, handed it to Joy, that was his, uh, his uh, girlfriend, who placed it on the cluttered kitchen table. And <laughs> you can imagine, I can just picture it now, mum and dad go, we'll give him a Scotty, he'll appreciate that. <laughs> and suddenly it's gonna get washed with all the other dishes. But there you go, yeah, that's the way it is. But yeah, no, Scotty, Scotty was a, an amazing character. And um, another one of those people that I met uh, at an early stage in my life, he's always stuck with me, always, you know. I still get excited by his work now. I recognize it in a heartbeat and I respond to it. It's interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> because some of Godier's work is now almost unbuyable, huge money. Lowry's work, stratospheric and yet Scotty Wilson despite the fact that he was collected by people like Picasso is still very very viable do you, do you think that's going to change I don't know um I I wonder where art buying is going to go you know because people like Scotty it it's really ironic because he is considered art brute um uh, as opposed to anything else. He's considered um, what? Art? Art brute. You know, that's what the French call naive art. Um, oh, yeah. Art brute. So um, you, I, I did a show uh, on Scotty in Paris about 15 years ago, and the prices were five, six times the price they are here. And they, they all sold because people absolutely adore him. Um, and he's one of the few... British artists that you could speak to a French dealer normally they're a bit strange about acknowledging any English artist or sorry British artist because Scotty was Scottish um maybe just say Scottish artist but there you go um they they're very hard to acknowledge things like that Scotty Wilson they are oh, Scotty Wilson oh c'est un ingenue you know they, they love him um, and he is one of those those artists that perhaps the English can't appreciate him in the same way. And I think this is true of a lot of uh, English people and British people that they struggle sometimes with left of centre art. Uh, I, I find it a little bit dismaying. I know you have success there because you push people into seeing these things and you present it so well you know but if people see things on their own they don't quite get it i think when they see things together and see a cohesive unit it starts to make sense for people but if you look at godier he had a unique voice and larry obviously had a unique voice and and scotty wilson's was almost a, a, a stronger unique voice than any of them and yet they're still available for really very, very uh, nominal amounts of money, the, the originals. Yeah, I agree. I agree, especially, as I say, it's not quite the same uh, on the continent, um, but there's less of it there. 
Um, but yeah, it, probably you could find Scotties appearing here, there and everywhere quite regularly in this country. And yes, if you want to buy one, you'll be able to afford one. Um, I still think he's somebody that people need to latch on because actually there's something so timeless about his work. You know, he's creating fantastical creatures. He's painting nature. He's, he's, his colour is vivid. You know, he, they are beautiful works of art. I, I can't praise his work high enough. You know, I mean, George Melly, you know, he wrote that wonderful book, It's All Writ Out For You, you know, which is a, a wonderful sort of affirmation of Scotty as an artist. And you do wonder why he hasn't elevated to the status he deserves. Maybe it's an art snobbery and the fact that he was uh, a naive artist, inverted commas. Um, but for me, that makes it even more powerful. Whatever naive art means, I guess, for a lot of people, that means somebody who's not had any formal training. Um, so from that point of view, surely should be even more celebrated. This is all natural. Yes. It comes from the heart. You, did, you, did your dad help him with, um, was it with designs for cloth or was it China or something? Yeah, he did the, he did a lot with, with uh, Scotty. I mean, he really helped get Scotty noticed. Again, he used his position in the studio magazine to promote these artists. You look at those 60s magazines, they're incredible sort of compilations of people who still are relevant today in a lot of ways, the, the people that dad picked out and that, that dad befriended. There's all sorts of people in there. And Scotty was one of them. And yeah, they, they got together and did a deal for with Royal Worcester uh, to design a whole dinner service for them, which which you see turn up regularly, you know, in in all over the place in shops and 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 what have you. It's still loved, and you can buy pieces of it. It's very rare you see a whole set, but you can build one up yourself. I mean, we had one for years. No, Daddy probably sold it eventually, but <laughs> but yeah, no, he did. He he helped. He helped promote Scotty an awful lot and he'd be selling on his behalf. That's something dad always did. He might buy on the secondary market, but he would also work with artists as well directly and try and enlarge them their market potential. Because a lot of these people, I mean, yeah, I, I'd make a joke about Scotty earning more than probably people realise, but there was a great period of his life where he earned nothing. You know, he was a he was a basically um uh, a junk dealer, wasn't he? A rag and bone man almost in Canada where he went to live because he was in the Merchant Navy, I think. So, you know, he had a, a, a difficult time, I think, at times. And he had to live on his wits. And I think Dad knew that and was always happy to, you know, be, oh, you know, taken advantage of yet again because he knew that was part of the game. Scotty enjoyed it. My dad enjoyed it. Even I enjoyed it, you know, so, yeah, uh, I, a lot of time for him and his work. And for those that go, I, I don't know this artist, just go and discover him. He's wonderful, truly wonderful. It was um, Picasso bought his work, didn't he? And who were, there was a, some other very famous... Buffet. Buffet bought his Buffet. Buffet. Du Buffet. Du Buffet, yes. Yeah, I mean, well, De Buffet put him into the Art Brut Museum, you know, in, and, uh, in Lausanne, I think it is. Um, yeah, De Buffet was a champion. So was Picasso, you know, as much as Picasso would champion anybody, you know, just by him buying your work is, well, look at the strength of it now. That was in whatever, 1953, I think it was a show, um, something like that. And we're still talking about it however many years later. That's, that's how much people should understand how good he was. You know, Picasso, Picasso had good taste, without a doubt, you know. But um, I'm just glad he didn't copy Scotty's style, otherwise it would have been all over. <laughs> and did you, when you were a little chap and you were meeting all these extraordinary people, did, did you realise that, that was the case or was did that come later on well i understood that people created art 
and that not everybody was able to create art well or with their own voice. I think I, I got taught that quite early on that, you know, this is a nice picture, but it's not very good because it's derivative. It doesn't do that. It's got no heart. It's got no soul. It's got no passion. It's got no flair. It's got no feeling. I, I started and then to be told also, but that's down to you to decide because sometimes the weirdest things resonate with us. And that's what art does, isn't it? Art resonates with us and connects with us in a way. Okay, here's a story. Um, a builder friend of ours um, came to see me once and he was a lovely chap, apart from the fact he was an Arsenal fan, which was dreadful. But um, that's another story. Um, but he came around, he wanted to buy, buy uh, some art and he'd never bought art in his life. And he came around and he's really gruff. I liked him a lot. And he sat in my room he said, and I showed him pictures and we had a cup of tea and we chatted. And he just suddenly went, no, no, I can't bear it. I can't bear it. It's all, it's all bloody lines and colour and I bloody like it. It doesn't make any bloody sense to me. I can't, I can't do it. No, why do I, why? I, no, I've got to go. And he went straight out the door and that was it. And um, I thought, that's very strange, but something happened to him. And then he phoned me about a week later. He said, I'm so sorry about that, but you know, I've had no education. I, I have no understanding of art. And, and I felt as though I didn't know why I liked something. And I said, that's art. You don't have to validate why you like anything. We connect in the strangest ways to a picture, an image, uh, something that we see. We don't know why. The trick is to just let it do that. Then you find yourself in a really interesting space. And that was it. He, he got completely immersed in art and he bought things because he liked them. You know, uh, and, and I think that that was an object lesson because actually all art is just lines and colour and sometimes not even colour. So, you know, what makes us respond? I don't know. It just is. Well, uh, an extraordinary upbringing that you had and amazing to have met all these people and little wonder that your own career is so remarkable. And next time we meet, because our half hour chat has turned into the thick end of an hour. I'm Sorry. Surprised. What are you going to show something else? What's that? Dad and Dali. Dad, your dad and Dali. Yeah. I didn't know he met Dali. Yes. Yeah, tell that was at Port Legat. That was, uh, I'll just tell you very quickly. Tell us about there. that. Sorry? Tell us about that. Okay. Well, yeah, he, he again, that was for the studio. And um, actually, in the same issue, uh, there's Colin Wilson and Lowry. So, so there you go. But um, if that's the, the cover of it for anyone that wants to seek it out. That is uh, number September 1961. Um, yeah, he went over to speak to Dali and he, he always told me that it was amazing because he got to Dali's house and he was quite nervous, which was unlike dad to even admit he was nervous. But um, yeah, they, they got in and Dali said, Mervyn Levy. Today, you are very lucky. <laughs> that is why, because today, Dali decides for you, he will speak in English. And that was it. Because apparently, if Dali didn't like the look of you when you came in, he would just speak in Catalan or, or, or whatever and, and not give you the time away a day and leave you bemused. So, yeah, that, that was... Uh, one of his greatest um, meetings, he said, to spend the day with Dali. And I can imagine it would have been fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful to, to hear. Um, Marvellous to listen to you talking about, about your dad um, and the extraordinary eye that he had. And, and I think I'm trying to remember who once told me that if you want to really know about painters uh, and artists, it's likely that it'll be a painter or an artist who will inform you best. 
rather than someone who who, who just sits on the outside as a, a an art historian or critic. Um, and your dad certainly had a remarkable eye and a phenomenal career. Um, and next time we meet, will you do this again with me? Absolutely. I'm going to leave it just because you've mentioned my dad's eye. Go on. This is a portrait that uh, Ruskin Spear did of dad. And wow. dad hated it because Ruskin deliberately made him boss eyed. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Pleasure. Ne next time we talk, I would love to talk more about some of your amazing exploits. Whenever. Because they've been they've been fantastic. Well, it's been a, it's been fun. I'm sorry, I haven't gone on too much today, but it's not, you draw not, this stuff out. Not at all. Kerry, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thanks. And I'll see you soon. Cheers. Bye. It's, hard, it's one third full size. Leonardo da Vinci, the Last Supper, which took me about six months. If he ever sold the place, what I'd do is cover the walls in the worst wallpaper you can ever think of. And then so people come first and say, oh, God, i got to move that, that wallpaper, get that off the wall as soon as possible, and do that. And suddenly come across this and say, I didn't know Leonardo had been to Maidstone. <laughs> Conservationist duo Ralph Steadman and Kerry Levy have teamed up with the Goldmark Gallery in Uppingham to produce a limited edition set of 10 prints focusing on extinct and endangered animals. Each stunning print in the 50 Strong Edition features one of Steadman's captivating animals or boids, accompanied by Levy's subtly imprinted words, which encapsulate the species' plight and will raise funds for species protector Wild Aid. This project, this is about... We couldn't stop doing the birds that were endangered. There's so many of them and so many kids throwing stones at little birds that we decided we've got to stop these little boys throwing stones at little birds. And he, he sort of came up with something far more sort of scientific. I think it's quite an incredible creature that the dodo is the it's symbol of everything we've lost, isn't yeah. it? Because it is more about the overall effect that we are having on the world being told through these pictures and yeah. hopefully make people go, I had no idea. So this is the vaquita. There's only 60 left in the world about a year or so ago and it's already halved. Yeah. This looks as though this may be the first major extinction of the 21st century. Do they really have teeth like that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, it may be a bit of artistic licence. Presented in a specially crafted handmade box, the creation of the Gonservation Suite is part of a worldwide campaign which includes global urban fashion brand Vans Footwear and the famed American brewery Flying Dog, with Daily Show host Trevor Noah hosting the New York launch party. Conservation is all about compassion and showing compassion to creatures and wildlife. Now it's an opportunity for me to draw silly pictures. And these now have, have been down to Ralph and you've approved them straight away and loved them. I think they found all these sort of areas oh, yeah. really hard to get the depth of them. How they did it, man. No, yeah. it is a feat of printing science, I There's think. There's no feet in it, I can't see any print anywhere. There. Oh, there's foot. There's, yeah. there's no, there's claws. I've got no choice. Look, Kerry. He says you can do this now, and you better not try to get out of it. He's one of the cruel endangered species. And he's endangered because I'll, I'll hit him one day. Hard. <laughs> With a mallet. We got a piece in one of the BBC Wildlife magazine and they were just going to print and I got a, a, a panicky phone call from the editor who said, oh my God, we've just noticed there's a blue slut. We, we can't have a blue slut on the BBC Wildlife <laughs> magazine. What, what do you mean? Ah, it's funny. a bird. It's a, yes, but it's, it's a blue slut. Ooh.